You know, the Bible says, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Now, this is one of the most controversial verse in the Bible, in the sense that people don't want to touch it, because they always think that we're saying that in order for you to have a lot of abounding grace, you must be an abounding sinner. It's not exactly correct to say it that way. I've meditated about this a lot myself. But the story that always comes to mind for me to be able to understand, that comes to mind for me, the illustration that Jesus gave, that really, uh, two of them actually, that Jesus gave that gives me a, a good understanding of this, was one, the story of the woman with the alabaster jar. If you look at some versions of that story, it was said that Jesus had met that woman before and he prayed for her and delivered her from several tormentors, some, several demons that were bothering her. She was a street woman. But where I want to re, 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 uh, relate to you is, was when Jesus met her again at the house of, if a, um, of, an, of a, one of the rich men in the city, a Pharisee, who invited Jesus to dinner. And who was trying to, and because he knew Jesus had now become a very popular preacher in the community, so he wanted to, 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 to treat him to a very good dinner with dignitaries. So in this dinner now, in Luke chapter 7, verse 36, and I will have to read it to be able to illustrate the point I'm trying to drive at today. Luke chapter 7, verse 36, it said, Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who, has lived, who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was sitting at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and she stood behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And Jesus actually read his thoughts. And Jesus said this. Jesus answered him. Jesus answered his thought. This man was thinking. He didn't know Jesus was. He said to himself now. But Jesus was able to discern what he was saying to himself. And so Jesus said, Jesus answered him directly. He said, Simon, I have something to tell you. This is interesting. He said, tell me, teacher, he said. Then Jesus told him. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One who owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he canceled the debts of both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, it's, it's amazing how people, when you give them illustration, how they can easily see the logic. Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. And Jesus said, you have judged correctly. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? 
I came into your house. You did not give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet, not with water, but with her tears from her body, and wiped them with her hair, part of her body. You did not kiss me, you did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, she had not stopped kissing my feet, my feet, with the sandals I wore with the dusted street of Jerusalem. My feet filled with dust. You did not pour on my oil on my head, but she had poured perfume on my feet. And the Bible also said that the perfume that he broke, the alabaster jar, was almost a whole year's wage. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. And Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven thee. So, what does all this mean? Now, we said in the initially, we said, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Well, the thing is, it's not that some people sin worse than others, as we always want to balance, put sins on a balance. It's just that some people hunger for righteousness more than others. And so the more you hunger for righteousness, the more you dig deep into trying to get close to God, the more you see how far you are from God. And because of the distance between you and God, you say, how can I touch this holy God? And God now reveals to you the pathway to touch him through the blood of Jesus by the grace that he has given us through the forgiven sin on Calvary. So, because you dug deep and you saw how wretched our righteousness is. You know, they say amazing grace. How sweet it is that saves a wretch like me. And some of us, especially Pentecostal, we don't like singing that song because we like to talk about the righteousness part of it. But the thing is, you can't really avail the grace of God until you understand how much is forgiven you, until you understand how much you can do for yourself. And the way you can understand it is the, is the depth at which you dig into the word of God to see how much you can do by yourself and to see how much Jesus has already done. Because in the Old Testament, when they were talking about Pound for pound judgment. You go and read it in the book of Leviticus and also in Deuteronomy. They said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hair for a hair, a leg for a leg, an arm for an arm. That's pound for pound judgment. When you, you sin, that was how detailed they were about equity and justice. But in the dispensation of grace now, Jesus now says, all your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. No other religion teaches that. They always talk about how much you can walk so that you can get from God, what you can do by yourself so that you can get from God. But this is saying that the more you know how much is forgiven you, not because, you see, the people that know how much they've forgiven them, it's not because they've sinned more, maybe some might, or and some of us that think we haven't done much. You remember the Pharisees when they came to Jesus? They said, when, they, when he opened the eye of the blind, they said, are we blind also? He told them, he said, because you think you see, you will remain blind. So, so those who are self-righteous will never know how much. Will never hunger much for righteousness. Why? Because they're already full of themselves. The, the, the fool up to here. If you are fool up to here, you can't take anything in. 
but those who empty, of, empty themselves of self-righteousness can be filled. Those who thirst and hunger for righteousness can be filled. But those who don't need a drink, they can be filled. Those who don't need food, they can be filled. So you have to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And the only way you hunger and thirst for righteousness is to draw near to God, seek to find out what he's done for you, seek to find out the death of, of, your, of, 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 your, of your sin. Let me share with you another passage that illustrates this. When God was talking to, when Jesus was talking to um, Peter about forgiveness. You see, we have to understand grace from the illustration that Jesus gave in the New Testament. You have to understand grace from the vantage point of forgiveness. In Matthew chapter 18, starting from verse 18, he said, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall lose on earth shall be loosed also in heaven. And again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I will be in the midst of them. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. In fact, if you look at this binding and losing that came before then, before that question of Peter, it's very important. Because see, if you bind people's sin, if you don't release them, you know they are bound. And, and, and that's why one has to look at what um, Simon, what, um, uh, what, uh, what, what was done when, when um, Simon, I believe it was Simon, who, who forgave Paul of Tarsus, who was holding the cloak of those who stoned him to death. And he said, Lord, do not hold this against them. He was releasing them. He was pre-releasing them. He was forgiving them. He was giving them beforehand. He was giving up before the hand. Forgive is to give before. It to forgive. Forgive. Give before. So, he, so the same thing here. Peter now said, well, if you don't want us to bind people, in, in unforgiveness, how often shall we forgive? Seven times? And the Lord said, not seven times, 70 times, seven times. Then he gave them an illustration. He said, therefore the kingdom of heaven is lacking unto a certain king, which take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not, nothing to pay, the Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children, and that all he had and payment be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave his debt. But the same servant went out and found out one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. Not denarii now, pence. Much less than denarii. A hundred. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou, thou owest me. And his fellow servants fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. And when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told their Lord all that was done. Then the Lord, after that, he had called him and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldn't thou have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And the Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. What's this saying to us here? 
This man was forgiven. You see, when you talk about grace in the New Testament, you cannot separate grace of the New Testament from forgiveness through the cross of Christ. They say by grace we are, faith, we are saved through faith. Faith in what? Faith in the finished work of Calvary. You always have to point this free gift, this indescribable gift of God to what Jesus did on the cross. There is no grace without Calvary. Forgiveness, what we've been forgiven, is through the blood of Jesus. So if you have faith that God has forgiven you through the cross, that faith should now motivate you to do good because you have faith in the grace of God that is showed by giving the Son to die for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever, whosoever, not merit or demerit, whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So that grace is the gift of the cross and whosoever believes in that. But to the extent that you believe that, to that extent, you should be motivated to also forgive. So the evidence that you believe that God has forgiven you is that you now are motivated to forgive others. If you don't forgive others, you are not grateful for being forgiven. Just like they said in this story, this man really doesn't have grace of God. Why? Because there's no evidence that he, he knew he was forgiven. There's no evidence that he, he, he received the gift. There's no evidence that he didn't think he deserved the, uh, the, the, the forgiveness from his, his, uh, his master. He probably thought he, 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 he manipulated his, his master to forgive him. Because if he actually received it, and he actually is grateful, he will not be asking for something much less from a fellow servant. This kind of thing happened to me. The grace of God can happen to you in so many different ways. There was a time in Washington, in, at, at, in Atlanta, when I first got saved. Around that time, Atlanta Falcons was going to host the Super Bowl. And I, God has changed my, my, my interest, my desires. I was not too much into going to watch touchdown every Sunday. So, but I had club seats for the Super Bowl. Now, I'm not saying anything is wrong when going to enjoy yourself. I'm just saying for me, it was just not my priority anymore. So I had two tickets for the Super Bowl, two $175 tickets. And the day before Super Bowl, I was sitting in my office, and I was speaking to a friend, and I said, you know, I had two tickets. I have two tickets for tomorrow's game. But I really don't want to go. I don't think I'm going. So he said, you've got two tickets for Super Bowl, and you're not doing anything about it? I said, like what? He said, you can sell those things, man. I said, really? He said, yes. Look in the papers. So I looked in the paper. There was an 800 number. So I called the 800 number. They said they want a ticket from me. I said, okay, how much? One, one of the 800 numbers said, we'll get, buy $1,000 each. I said, really? He said, yeah, I'm going to get it from you. I, I, you can bring it to me, I, 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 and I'll give you $2,000. So I called the second number. They said, we'll get it for you, $1,500 each. So two $300 tickets, 175 times two, what's that? $350. I sold them for $3,500. $3,500. Uh, oh no, fifteen hundred, three thousand dollars So I it was a Saturday, I was in my office, a lady came in. Now God has just given me a grace of abundance. A lady came in who needed money, but he didn't, he came in as a patient. So he was talk, she, she was talking to me. She said, well, I have a headache, I have a chest pain, I have a backache, and uh, they're going to turn off my my, my gas tomorrow, and I was saying to myself, is this a, is this a financial issue or a medical issue? Well, and they're going to turn off my gas tomorrow, and I don't even have, uh, I, and my tire is, uh, is bad. But, ah. Then I finally asked her, I said, okay, this financial issue you're talking about, how much do you really need? 
you know. No, before I even asked her that, I had the Lord tell me, give her $200. So now I asked her, I said, how much do you need? She said, no, 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 you're my doctor. I, I don't need any money from you. You're just my doctor. I said, how much do you need, ma'am? She said, I need $200. And I had it by the Spirit of God five minutes earlier. What was God trying to teach me there? Grace. God was trying to teach, use that circumstance to show me how grace works. That I should be grateful to him for making me not desire to go to that thing and desire something else. And for me letting go of those tickets for $3,000. And if, I show, if I'm grateful about that, I should now show grace. Show, and should, uh, my attitude of gratitude should be extended towards others. My friend, that's how it's going to work with us. We have to learn to show grace of God to other people. Now, in round this is up, let me go over certain things that, is, that are very important. We start again with the definition of grace. Grace is a gift of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9. By grace, ye are saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Number two, grace in its basic and fundamental meaning means, listen carefully, we sinned against God and he gave his son as a gift to pay for our sins. That is the bottom line. If you don't believe that, you don't know what grace is all about, at least the New Testament definition. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God through him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Number three, the more you have a comprehensive understanding of sin and its consequences, the more you can avail grace and its amazing benefits. Read Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Number four, you understand the consequence of sin by your hunger for righteousness that makes a way of escape for you from sin. Number five. Number, the question number five is, the question, one question, how do you now avail grace? You avail grace by faith in what Jesus accomplished through his blood and not by works. Even the faith to avail grace is the work of the Holy Spirit. You must remember that. Why? Because it's the spirit of grace and supplication. Supplication means plea for mercy. Plea for mercy. Plea for mercy. So the faith to avail grace, the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, if is the spirit of supplication, is when you begin to now cry from the soul that this there's got to be a better way than this. I've come to the end of myself. Help! Have mercy! Have mercy! It's your soul that is crying out. It's not something you verbalize in your mouth. But deep down in you, you've come to the end of self-effort. And that spirit of supplication will come to you, the Holy Spirit, and it will draw you towards Jesus and towards Calvary. And you, you will see what is done. The Bible says in the book of Ze Zechariah that when they see me, God will open their eyes, they will see me who they have pierced. It's when you come to that point of mercy that you can see Jesus who we pierced by our rebelliousness and who came to die for us. The next point is, the evidence that you have availed grace in an area is your sincere attitude of gratitude in that area. Let me repeat that. The evidence that you have availed grace in an area is your sincere attitude of gratitude to God in that area. If you are not grateful, you cannot continue to grow in grace. Let me say that again. If you are not grateful, you cannot continue to grow in grace. The next point is, the key to abundant grace is to continue to seek to know and appreciate how much the Lord has forgiven you. Let me say it again. The key to abundant grace is to continue to seek to know and appreciate how much the Lord has forgiven you. You have to continue to dig into it, continue to dig into the word, 
as you dig into the word, you will understand the depth of sin. You see, you are not, you are not doing that because you are, being, you are trying to be sin conscious. You, no, you are doing it because you are trying to find out how much love God has for you. That's why you are doing it. The next point is, if you are not grateful towards God as evidenced by your act of mercy towards others, the grace you think you have may not be the grace. It may, not be by, be, it may not be grace. It may be works. Let me say that again. If you are not grateful towards God as evidenced by your act of mercy towards others, the grace you think you have may not be grace at all. It may be works. Read Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 24. And grace ought to motivate you to cheerful sharing of what you have with others. Grace ought to motivate you to hunger for more righteousness. And finally, grace ought to motivate you to seek to draw nearer and nearer and nearer to Christ through the spirit of grace. Let me say that one more time. Grace ought to motivate you to seek to draw nearer and nearer and nearer to Christ through the Spirit of Grace. That is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Grace and supplication. That's going to have to do it for us today. I'm your host, Akin Ayeni, born again Christian, family physician, a servant of the Most High God. And join us every Sunday at Lighters for All Nations in Atlanta, Georgia.